Beautiful. Let's go ahead and we'll get ourselves started today. Today, what we'd love to do is actually kind of keep on plugging around in Navisworks and just working with different sorts of models and start pushing a little bit further in terms of how we can how we actually use the tool and creating some different sets for identifying different objects of interest and really start to push into the, uh, how we can start looking at when files are linked and things are overlapping, how we can find free clashes and interferences. And really, it's kind of the bulk of what a lot happens in all these sort of job site meetings as people try to do all sorts of BIM coordination. So we're going to be looking at the clash detective tool and how we can use that with a model. But I want to introduce a different model today, one that has a little more data to it and would be actually familiar to you guys, or somewhat more familiar to you guys. It's a model of a hospital, and it's a fictitious hospital. It's called the West Riverside Hospital. But um, it was done really as an example project to really look at uh, putting together a very realistic multidisciplinary model where the architectural, the structural, the mechanical, and all the complexity of linking those things would be seen. So in terms of uh, the data sets that we hand out, there are a bunch of different files, mechanical, architectural, structural, and plumbing. I have even more files for the whole thing, too. But uh, these are the four that I got converted over today. And we can take a look at those, and also kind of bring them into Navisworks or into BIM 360 to sort of understand the hospital and how it all goes in terms of putting together all the layers of complexity. But then go ahead and start thinking about trying to find some clashes in here and really think about the coordination between all these different traits. So just to get a sense of the hospital, a great place to start is just actually opening the architectural model if you want to. If you open that, these were all part of, oh, a system called work sharing. We haven't actually done that very much around here, but I'll show you how to do that in another session where we can work on a model simultaneously. You and I and Ronnie could all be actually physically at the same time working on things. I think actually, Alhamdi, did your group play with that at 128? Uh, it was my group. It was a different group. Was it was, right? um, remember, it was Erwin and Ali uh, and Marsha. Yeah, yeah. No worries. So. This is actually linked to some other files. I'm just going to say ignore that right now. Actually, what it's asking for is I've changed the names of some of the different files. So some of the linked files, it's just not finding. This is just the architectural file. Let's just go for this right now. I'll say ignore it. And if you go zipping around in here, you'll see it's actually a pretty detailed model. I'm going to zoom on down a little bit. You can see that there's, you know, oh, I think it's seven different levels on this thing. You have uh, really a bunch of hospital patient rooms. There's solar arrays up on the roof, which could probably use your smart object to do a much better job in terms of uh, kind of locating all that. Actually, Robbie, I'll share with you, there's another file, which is really the conceptual design model, which is really more about the energy modeling and how they came up with this notion of, you know, if you take a look at the model, let me zoom back out again a little bit. I'll ZO to get out there. It's a big model, too. That's actually a little hard part about working with it. You'll see it's a center spine, okay, the part that's happening kind of right down here in the center, and then it's these different wings that sort of spread off. And the different rings are really designed so that from an energy standpoint, a daylighting standpoint, basically everyone has the ability to get natural daylighting, get an exterior wall surface, have these different gardens, you know, even in terms of the energy collection, as you think about the space between all the different wings that come off that core, you know, there's a lot of southern exposure, a lot of different surfaces that are exposed that way. So it was really done kind of after a lot of the conceptual design to really think about the energy performance. And so, yeah, everything's sort of very interesting about the building. Even you can start to see how it starts being sort of relatively planar down here at the end on the right hand side. You can start to see where it starts, the successive floors keep on peeling back a little bit, kind of following a little bit of a curve. And that might appeal to you in terms of thinking about that. As you look at this overall structure, and we'll go inside it in just a little bit, it's you know a lot of different interesting things. There's sort of a central atrium in that central core. Yeah. As you think about that big space in the middle there, it kind of looks like a big open void there with a heliport on top of it. Kind of zoom on up there a little bit. And you, you might be wondering what that is all about in terms of this large kind of space up there and how that space is going to get used. 
And by opening some of the other models, you can start to see how it will actually play out. Um, you can open the structural model. The structural model is actually not too bad either. And we can link them. Or what I'm going to do is that we're going to just put them all over into uh, BIM 360 or into Navisworks also. If I go to the example data sets, let me open the structural one. See what's going on here. Is it open? Are you sure you opened the correct one? I am not sure. Hospital <laughs> metrics structural. I think it's still doing something. Oh, okay. I just thought the icon looked a little bit weird. Let me see. There we go. So in this model, you can see, oh, we have looks like it's primarily a steel frame structure, so the most correct things are going vertically straight up. Up here at the front, where the building camps out a little bit, you start seeing a little slope column action. For the most part, the floor plan is very regular. You can see the floors, the structural floors, are actually carried in the structural pile. Even the thing that I think of as a roof is actually just modeled as a floor. That sounds probably familiar to you. Down here at the bottom, you start to see that there are not only a combination of big sort of pier footings, but actually wall footings that are working together. So if we go zooming on down, you'll see that we have kind of these piers under the individual columns where it spreads on out and goes to a spread footing. Around the outside surface, it looks like there's some weight coming down because we have a little bit of a wall footing here also. But what's happening here in the center is we actually have like individual pads and Oh, like piers coming underneath them. Let me flip that up so it'll look a little bit better. You start to see the outer ring, you have all these real piers, except there's not enough for each of the different column locations. Okay. What happens here around the outside, the ring sort of acts, that wall tracks a big continuous ring. So even what happens here is the weight of that one column coming down is sort of spread along the ring so that the whole outside surface kind of carries it together. But quite an interesting complex project. The other file I want you to open, let's just kind of open them again. Let's open up the um, mechanical. That's the one I want you to see, not only in terms of the complexity of the mechanical, but it sort of explains what's going on in that center portion of the building. Okay. Um, this is a very common technique. People have a detailed view that it opens up to, which just sort of is very quick to open up to because it's just text, but I'm going to go to the default 3D. And if you go zooming in on that, you'll start seeing, well, <laughs> layers and layers of complexity. Maybe we'll turn some of them on just as off in just a second. At some level, you see a lot of fresh air. You see a lot of return air, you know, different types of systems moving around. It looks like, as I look down here, you can sort of see that the supply air is coming through the little purple ducts. Those other terminals which are hanging around are those are return ducts. It looks like the air is going up to the ceiling and kind of popping up that way. This looks like it's probably some sort of a fresh air system. But you see what's happening is they're bringing everything up from the individual wings. And then there's actually this incredibly large duct, this huge duct that's running across the entire top of the building. And going back to some chillers back over there, some sort of oh, air handling units that are kind of popping around in here. But it's all really happening. You, know, you start seeing pumps for the chillers and stuff like that. It's all happening at the top. And if we go back to the architectural file, you'll actually see, and go popping back over there, that that's what this big space at the top here is. This is really like just a big mechanical penthouse. And then above the roof, there's all these vents on the sides that are really just bringing in fresh air. So all of that air handling equipment 
is happening up here in the center spine, but just hidden from you, so you can't see it. Okay, so it's kind of nice that way. If we went zooming on in very close, you'll see those are just a bunch of louvers that are uh, kind of positioning the walls for letting the pressure in there. The last file that's part of this set is the plumbing file. So if you open that one up, let's take a look at that. You'll see here that we have all the water handling. And if we look at sort of a typical stack here, so we can figure out what's going on. I'm not even sure if this is the whole system. This only looks like part of the system. Or maybe I'm looking at it for each of the different wings. I guess that's it. For each of the different wings coming off on the side, you'll see that there's a series of different basically patient bathrooms. These are all happening in the patient rooms. So it looks like on each side of the hallway, one, two, three, four, there's four rooms, or these four bathrooms on each side. They're kind of doubled up and banged up. And as you look at it, we have the red, the blue, the red being the hot water, the blue being the cold water, and the green being uh, just the sanitary system. So in this case, you have the sanitary system not only carrying away the toilets and things like that, you actually have all these little floor drains, which are in the floor also to go through and kind of pick up water. We have the hot water for the cold water. That's interesting. Well, I would imagine going to the shower head. And the sinks. But yeah, you see just all sorts of information here. The, the point of all this is really, it gets to be an incredibly complex model. And I think that's what you're seeing on your site, is that you know, here we only have four of the models open. There's actually another like five or six of them that are available in the set for different things. Just in the set that Autodesk put together to illustrate this, you come back and I'll go over to D. Show you that. In addition to the ones that we're looking at here, there's one for the parking garage, maybe not like that. You have the sprinkler system, the site, the site logistics, the fire alarm, the electrical, it's just a bunch of stuff. Here's what's going on there. So how to handle all this? Yeah, it starts with really saying, great, all our Revit files are fine, but boy, you know, Revit is even good when I'm linking files together. I can, even in Revit, I can go through and do interference between one, or two files. I, I can sort of look that way. But I don't really have the ability to look across multiple different files. This is going to show you how that part works, is that back in Revit, if I come back over here, and I'm going to close some of these different things. I'm just going to close the structural, or the uh, plumbing. I'm also going to go ahead and close the mechanical. I'll just leave architectural and uh, kind of structural open for now. What I can do is, oh, to, in order to link them together in Revit properly, what I should do is go over to the structural and even close it because I can't keep it open for editing at the same time. I'm in architecture. If I go back and say manage or insert, I'm going to do it that way, and I'm going to link a Revit file, we'll go to the uh, structural file. See if it's by origin to origin. I'm hoping it is. Okay, nested links won't appear. That's okay. So at least now I have the structural and the architectural back together. What you can do is even in Revit, you know, as you're working in link files, you can think about the whole issue of whether things interfere. And where it lives in the world of Revit okay, is under the Collaborate tab. So if you go to Collaborate tab, we haven't really played around too much in here. We looked at copy monitoring things across, okay, uh, go through and kind of pull some shared elements that we use. There's this whole notion even in here of doing something called interference checking. Some of the choices under here, one is coordination and review and coordination settings. That's all about 
you, I've copy monitored some things and someone's changed it over in their file, deciding do I want to accept their change or insist on my change and reject theirs, or and how do we work with that? The interference checking is the feature that's built right into Revit. So if you say interference checking, it looks like this. You say, let's go ahead and choose some categories from, you can either do two different categories from the same project, or we can do from two different products, the main product and a linked file, so you can do it that way. Okay. But in terms of what we're able to do, it's somewhat limited in that we can work with the main categories, but we can't really set up a detailed selection set where we really get at subsets of specifically what's interesting to us. So if, for example, we said we're going to look at the doors, we're going to get all the doors. It's really pretty limited about what we can do right within Revit. So if I say that I want to look at everything from the current project, and I'll contrast it with things in the structural file, at a high level, I can say, great, let's go ahead. I'm going to look at, oh, you know, all the walls versus the structural columns, something like that. So I'll choose those two different things and say, super. OK, I'm going to go through and take a look at that. If we looked under structural framing, OK, we get a few subcategories in there. But it's pretty limited in terms of how much we control here, which is why well, it's good for sort of quickie stuff, but it's not really good for doing very detailed stuff. Okay. The biggest limitation is that you can only do two things at a time, okay, where in some other tools like Navisworks, you can actually do a whole bunch of different files at a time. But you say, let's go ahead and check those. It's going to find, at least for now, that there are a whole bunch of walls and structural columns that are sort of interfering with each other. Let's talk about what interfering means. It means that they're intersecting. Now, why do things intersect? It could be that you, know, you just haven't modeled things very carefully. Because a lot of times when we go through and we put columns through floors or columns through walls, we just don't take the time to do everything very, very carefully. Yeah, that's okay. We just accept it as a known defect in the model. And that's okay. Yeah. Other times it truly is because there's an unexpected interference. And even as we think about the interferences, there's the notion that things are actually you know, on top of each other. There's that they're side by side but touching. There's that they're a very close and in within a zone of like a, just a interference. So you can have a bubble of like a, a zone that you want to have as a clearance zone around things. And that's often very useful. Yeah, I think uh, even what you guys are talking about on your job, there's that whole, uh, what was the case? It was the stairway. There, there was something where basically someone hadn't allowed clearance for the fact that even though things could physically sort of be right next to each other, in the process of actually building things, you just need a little bit of clearance to get a wrench in there, to tighten the bolts, or something like that, right? And yeah. what were we talking about that happens on the second? Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, it looked perfect in the model, okay, but you still can't get it in there. In fact, there are even lawsuits about this, where yeah, you, you get this incredibly detailed model, and it all looks like it fits. But yeah, you go ahead and figure out how to get it in there, because yeah, nothing interfered, but there was no way to actually get it in there, because it was so intertwined and snaky. OK, so you could go ahead and say, great, let's go through, and for any of these things, go through and find those things. And then I can say, great, OK, there's some exterior wall and some structural column here that are sort of interfering with each other. I can say, show. And it'll go ahead and try and find some view where I can see that. And it's going to work hard. And this is kind of an OK way to do it. But I'm not advocating it this way, because it's really pretty weak about how it does it where there are better tools for doing it. And that's what we're going to move into pretty quickly. But I just want to kind of show how it all fits. So in here, I'd even have a hard time finding where it is. Somewhere in this view. OK, they're already shown. Well, that's very nice, but it's a little hard to see because they aren't really zoomed up. I'd have to go looking for where the red items are that are actually indicating where they are. But we won't do it that way. So we can sort it in terms of whether we want to see all the structural columns that are interfering with walls or the walls that are interfering with structural columns, however you want to look at it. 
Actually, this is kind of important. This grouping actually helps you out a little bit because you can start to have things that are, uh, well, yeah, like this particular wall, 186972, is interfering with a couple of different columns. Yeah, it gets the whole thing about how you want to group things. Okay, but again, this isn't the best way to do it, but it's okay for getting started. If you're just working in Reddit and you want to start understanding quickly, you can do it this way. But a better way to do this is probably as follows. You can go through and export these things to Navisworks. And for any of these files, when you go through and say add-ins, and you say, let's take it to Navisworks 2015. A couple different things to watch out for here. I did this before you guys got here, so that was the other, you guys are coming in. I was saving these different files, these NWC files. Okay, so that's the other thing that's in session four in that folder. In terms of the settings, I didn't do much special here at all, but I did turn off convert link files. And even in terms of doing this, I did it because in the architectural file, I didn't want to also export the structural ones because I wanted to do that independently, as opposed to kind of the current version that's in the architecture. So no worries, I did that, I said save, and it kind of pops it off, and that's actually pretty good. So I say save, and when it does that, again, what it does, I'll just do it right here. You'll see it kind of gives me this little export window. It's gonna give me everything that is currently visible over here, so there's 16,000 objects out there. And it'll go pop it out. And then the cap will pop over like 32,000 objects, something like that. So one way to do this is to do it just directly uh, creating an NWC file. The other way, if we don't want to use Navisworks, we want to do it in BIM 360, which again is sort of a web-based equivalent, it has very similar features, is to, instead of going to the Navisworks, go to, where can I find it? BIM 360, right back here, and we'll say glue it. It's sort of essentially the same operation in terms of what's going on. So if I wanted to do that, let me even go ahead and start that up just so I can kind of have that going in the background as we're working in Navisworks. Let me sign in. Let's see if that's there. I'll create a project for the hospital and we'll glue, glue it into that. Okay, so in our site, You'll see there's all sorts of existing projects in there. And let me go through, and what I'm gonna do is go to admin. The way this kind of works, it's, you know, I guess kind of unfortunate. It, 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 no, it's really it's just a matter of security. It's going through, and not everyone can create new projects. Basically, you have an administrator who creates projects. And then you allow people to contribute to the project. So in here, let me go through, I'm gonna create a new project, I'll call it, CEE 120D or 220D. I'll call it hospital. And then over here, I could put a value in there, but instead, I'm just going to go ahead and add us to it. So Alejandro's here, and Rami is there, and Mr. Zilkowicz is there, and we can get Nicholas in there just in case he's able to watch. Finally, Glenn. Okay, so we'll have a project we can all work with. So let me go back over to Revit. Looks like it's still finishing up whatever it's doing. A lot of file, a lot of things to watch out for. Again, I tend to like to export the NWC file if you go to Navisworks and say open the rev file, it does the same thing, but I've had a little less luck on the reliability with that. For this one, Glenn? Yes. You're exporting the both files uh, put together, right? The structural and the Actually, architectural? I turned off the export linked, so it's only doing the architectural. If you do the if you if you don't turn it off, then it then sends it would both actually of them? it sends the it tunnels down and sends the linked file too. Okay, and then would you be able to see that in the selection tree as two independent projects and two independent things, or would it that's, only be one? 
That's actually a very good question. Why don't you try it? Like, turn off that, yeah, you know, turn on the link files. Let's see if it is. That's actually a really good question in terms of, I'm trying to remember if it shows up. I think it still shows up. Like, it's, it's somehow it's indented, because it's understood that it's being subordinate to it. Again, so what you would do is, I've linked them together, so go to Navisworks, and if I want to send them together, I'll say Navisworks settings, and I'll say convert the linked files. So just try sending that out as we go ahead. I'm sort of curious. Okay, so before you got here, you went ahead and saved out the architectural, the structural, the mechanical, and the plumbing. So I'll just try pulling them together into Navisworks and sort of uh, seeing it all. The nice thing again about Navisworks is, you even notice here, this project is so big that it's kind of heavy. It sort of feels, it's slow about what's going on, okay? And that's because it's a big old file. In Navisworks or even in BIM 360, it's a little bit easier. Let me go through over here, just as we're out. I'm going to glue this to that project that we just created. Okay, and Trixie. Okay, so I'll go to that BSI glue. And let's see if we can find that O220D hospital. It's somewhere hanging around in there. Oh, say more of those. So we'll choose that as the project we want to send it to. Then we can again choose which version or what view we want there. And actually, I don't really want a whole lot of any of that. I just want one of the 3D views. The default 3D view should be fine. If I carry the other views, what's going to happen is, like, I can say essentially all the sheet views, so someone can print them all out. You can get the floor plan views and look at that. It really just depends on whether you want to be able to see the floor plan view and share that and annotate it and mark it up the same way, or just want to do it in 3D. It's like, that's, that's perfectly valid to do it that way, too. In fact, maybe even, let's go back. Let me go, let's do, I'll do floor plan level two modeling in addition to the 3D view, just so we can sort of see the effect of getting those both. Okay, I have the choice of an NWC file or a DWF file. I tend to get the NWC ones because I think it carries a little more information. More options, you get the whole notion about if there's a shared coordinate system or whether we want to include the rooms. I'm going to say glue it. So what it's doing, you might recognize, since I told it that it's going to use an NWC file, is it's going to go back and do that. Although this time, I think it's a little more interesting. You can sort of see it's creating that. It looks like it's still just carrying 16921. So it looks like it's getting just the architectural features. Because that's what we had in that model. I believe. So it's doing essentially the same thing. It's the question I really want to look at it now. It's sort of something to look at it in the uh, 360. Okay. I'm going to let it keep on doing its thing. It's going to keep, just go off and do its thing. Okay, in terms of sending that up to the cloud. And as it's working ever so nicely, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to open up Navisworks because we actually saved out these Navisworks files. We could try bringing them together and integrating them into a single model. Let's see if that'll work. There we go. What do you think, Alejandro? If you so say export What happens? You can't export it? What happens? Did you hear? Oh, it's just not installed in this. No worries. That's just, it has to do with just how this works. Yeah, because it, it would be, it'd be right next door, you know, in terms of there being some other kind of choice there. Yeah, I think normal is Windows Ah, let's go and fix it for your guys so you do have it in there. Let's do this. Um, go to the control panel. 
and go to Programs, and say Programs and Features, and see if we can find, it's like Autodesk and Atlas Works, um, 2015 Exporters. Go down. Yeah, yeah, open that. Let me see if I, I'll, I'll open it up on my machine too. Okay, now we're flash. Well, if, well, you really, I say no. <laughs> No, I'll show you what we got to do. It's a, uh, it's very close. Um, because I'm there in, in the programs and features that you know, let me uninstall. Okay. Hang tight. Where did my control panel go? Pictures. Oh, there's control panel right there. Let's see if I can bring this up. I'll say okay to that. Do you have the control panel open? I'm gonna, I was trying to demonstrate it here, but I'll just tell you about it in terms of if it's got a fight with me. When you have that interface open, okay, go ahead and choose that, and say add install change. Now, I mean, now, here's the part where you have to use the top secret password. I remember. I remember you remember it? Number. Hang on. I'll put it over here. Backslash. Backslash. <laughs> Hang on. camera. <laughs> so Alejandro, what's your ATM code? <laughs> okay, looks like that glued. Okay, so is it running? Okay, and when it's inside, that's good. So again, don't worry about all these machines. For now, just use the ones that I gave you. But it's that if you run into that problem on your machine that you have and you have the install disk. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. So we have these files. They're hanging around. We've uh, saved them out of Revit. Let's go to Navisworks. We'll try integrating them there as well as we'll go over to uh, like Glue and kind of check them out over there. So I'm sitting around here now. This works my perfectly blank screen hanging around out there. If I want to go through and bring them in, I will say append. Okay. 
don't do that. Go to home, append. Okay, and now we're gonna go out to, and just for start with in the hospital from the Navisworks files, um, NWCs. Okay, let's start with the architectural. If you're feeling really daring, you could actually choose more than a single file. You could choose structural and all that type of stuff. So here we are. I can go through and append the structural, the mechanical, and the plumbing also. Cross your fingers and hope for the best. Beautiful, okay. So that's not too awfully bad in terms of what's going on. We see the mechanical or all the structural stuff underneath. We see the top view over here. In the selection tree, you sort of see the different files over here. So again, if we wanna hide something, we can right click on it. It's, it's doing a lot of drawing. Every time I choose that tree, it's selecting all the items in that subtree I can hide things. Now you just have this notion of, let me orbit that around. You can sort of see that whole penthouse mechanical space and just the structure around it. You can start to see like, all the columns and all that stuff. Very good there. Or if you turn that back on again, Okay, now in terms of just actually exploring the space, let's do this because you should sort of get a better sense of the space. Let's kind of just kind of navigate down to the front door. Oops. In Navis works, but then also see if I can bring it up in um, blue also. So in this sort of vision, if I went to down to the uh, viewpoint, and I can choose either walk, or I'm gonna choose fly through right now because I didn't want to sort of navigate my way down to the first floor. So I'm gonna say fly. I hit myself. <laughs> okay, and now I can go back and say walk instead. can start to see. I'm a little bit low. Let me turn on my realism. That'll sort of give me the whole uh, hopefully better walking experience. I feel like I'm down in the ground. I'm trying to panning it down now. There we go. So here we are. Go walking in. That's the main desk. Looks like there's a nice water wall feature back behind. If I want to look up, I can start to see that there's actually sort of a big atrium, or a multi-story atrium up there. You can also see there's some things missing from this model, just in terms of, oh, like the soffit walls are happening here on the side. I'm seeing a little bit more of the uh, mechanical than I probably want to. Let's kind of walk around back into the atrium. I see some nice, attractive, uh, kind of pan that over, stairway back there. My sense of scale feels really funny. I'm not sure what's going on. Well, maybe I'm above the ground now. Okay, back into the atrium there. We're looking pretty good. Okay, the same sort of operation, like here we're doing it just within uh, Navisworks right now. It's actually sort of interesting, even here, oh, for everyone who's played around the structural system, you got frustrated by the fact that the braces don't look like they actually join properly at the corner. Yeah. But all of it's right in here. If it's not modeled accurately, we can move it, or 
well accurate from an analytical standpoint because it was looking at spatially, right? And so let's see it here. Let's try going over to glue for just a minute and sort of see if we can sort of uh, see the same model. I'm going to go over to glue. Q20D, session one. I see projects, but I don't see anything in here. Do I have to accept my invitation? Try just refreshing it, see if it is actually there. There is hospital. Great. So in the hospital project over here, let's try looking at the floor plan level too. I'm just sort of curious what that one comes up looking like. Okay, so this is just the floor plan view, which I suppose now we could mark up and kind of do some things too. Zoom on in. Okay, but it is just a 2D view, so there's limits about what we can do. Or if instead I go back to the model and I say, that's just all those pieces. Let me go back to the other model. Uh, close up that view thing there. I'll go to the 3D model and I think we'll have a little more uh, stuff to play with. Taking a little more time to load, because it is a pretty complex model, although not nearly as heavy as some things could be. So here we are in glue. It's sort of building things up slowly. The idea is it's supposed to only really pass as much information as it is necessary to go ahead and graphically represent it at any one point. So it should be fairly quick. Considering that you're sort of operating from the cloud over the web or something like that, it actually probably isn't too awfully bad. But this is definitely a heavy model. So as it's loading and we're working on all that stuff, we can do the same sort of things I want to fly. I feel like I'm dropping precipitously. Maybe I'll fly. Don't crash into the building. Okay. Well, so much for that. <laughs> We go back to the home view. Maybe that'll be a little bit better still. I'll try doing a little orbit so I come at it from a better angle. Okay, then my flying should be a little bit better. I'm crashing through the doors <laughs> and a wall. Okay, let's put the third person in. I'll go back to walking and I'll turn on the third person. Let's see where I am. Actually, let me turn off collision right now. I'm probably sort of stuck in. I don't know if I have collision on right now. I'm trying to figure out where I am. Okay, that's looking a little better. Huh. I'm out by the loading dock, I can tell that. <laughs> Behind the hospital. Yeah, I'm looking inside of a trailer. 
Okay, let's try walking in again. Okay, there we are. That's looking a little bit better. So I can come through the door. So it looks like I'm a little short. But the idea, and hopefully you're sort of getting this. Well. What's that? You can use the arrows as well. Ah. So arrow up and arrow down. Or which? Maybe not for me, but that's only because I have this funny Mac keyboard. Okay, so for you, the arrows, how does it work? You arrow forward, you arrow back. I probably have to turn on some funny mode just because I'm on the Mac keyboard. So, especially if you're a gamer, that probably feels very good as a way of getting around. At some level, what we're doing now in terms of, you know, moving through, walking, saving viewpoints, whatever we're doing now, it's really, you see, it's sort of the same. Navisworks and uh, BIM 360 don't really have much of a difference there. What I have brought today for you guys is um, the iPad version. So let's see if we can bring it up in both these things and I'll sign in and you can sort of see what it's actually like to navigate around in that version too. Because it's kind of cool. We come back out here. Oh, this is interesting. This is this one understands about being on the internet. This one hasn't been here before, so I'll do. Yeah. Yes. Is the one that we're looking at only architectural? Yes. Oh, so that's why. That's why the structural floors are missing. I haven't glued the structure yet. Let's see what I have here. It's interesting. I'm off the web there, that's okay. Let me come over here. Two twenty D hospital. Let's see if I can get this one to actually understand about my uh, phone. So you could use that. Visitor, couldn't we? Excellent. I'm connected. It's much better than it used to be. It used to be if you weren't all set up, you were really hosed. But in terms of playing with it, this is wrong on me. Here's the iPad version. See if you can sort of like uh, navigate around in there. up and down, you sort of zoom in and zoom out. And if you want to walk, here's this little guy over here. Like if you push forward, it kind of walks you in. So it's 
download it. Give it a second to download. Okay. Maybe as we're doing that, is it waiting for that thing to download? Let me go ahead. I'm going to up. I'll glue the structural model up there too. So we have that available also. Okay, so we'll say in the same sense that mechanical one's a little bit of a nightmare. So we'll leave that off. Let me open up structural again and I'll glue that. Okay, and send sense over here, I'll go to add-ins, I'll say glue it. 3D, it's gonna go to the hospital project, super. And then what'll happen is, when I take it over to the hospital, I'll merge the two together. So merging is the essential uh, the equivalent of linking. Okay, so how's yours doing in terms of it uploading? Yeah, yes, it's good, okay. So in a second, it's sort of doing its thing. Then, you know, we do a little spin, do a pinch, do a navigate. It's kind of drawing as it goes. You can save a viewpoint or whatever. And theoretically, the same viewpoints that you're saving here, you know, like someone saved a viewpoint, it, it should pop in there for all of us, whether I'm working on the web or you guys are working on the, uh, Let's call this structural. Watch out for having things the same names. So I go back over to this and I say that great, let me go ahead and save some sort of viewpoint. save that away. If I go navigating around, what again, as soon as it's sort of a, uh, go to the front lobby, as soon as it finishes updating, and it looks like I'm, sta I'm standing on the desk. <laughs> a little bit better. So I'll save that viewpoint as the front lobby. Okay, and that should all save itself away. It should still be just architectural. What's going to happen is the structural, and as soon as it's glued, then we'll merge them together. Okay, so I'm called a merge model. And get a bulk. At some point, those uh, new viewpoints ought to show up for you, too. Move it in here. If I go walking around and turn on my collision and all that type of stuff, or gravity, I ought to be able to walk up the stairs. It's dizzying. I need to get the keys. Go back to the front lobby again. <laughs> I guess that's one nice thing about saving the viewpoints is when it starts going completely mad, you can very quickly get back out to a sensible place.
Hey, let me go back to Revit and see if it finished up. It has been successfully glued. Okay, let me try this. What I'll do is I'll go back out to hospital and see if I can merge those together. The idea now is, what do I have? Like I said, with the architectural 3D, and this is the structural 3D, when I want to get those two things together in the linking sense, what I'll do is I'll say I'll make a new merge model. So this one I just know is the architectural one. I should have given it a better name, actually, when it's there, even in here. I should change that. But when I want to merge the models, what do I do is I'm going to get the architectural one, I get the structural one, and call this arc struct merged. What is it today? 1577. So that will create this overlaid set of the two models. Can so, create a view here? I think, it, I think it should be able to. Can you? Where is it? In the views tab. Yes. And then, is it only that we can only view the views, but you can't actually create them? Well, that's great because I can go to the markups and I can actually create a markup. Exactly. Try creating. Try creating a markup, because that'll include a view as you go, but no, you, you're correct. You should, I expect you should be able to kind of create a view right there, too. Now notice, one of the things that sort of bothers me even about this is this merge model has a different set of views. Like, I can't just sort of get the other views back in there which I think is a little annoying. There ought to be some way to import them or something like that, somehow be able to export them and bring them across because those viewpoints are still valid. I think even in B when we were playing around the whole notion of how the views worked was somehow, it didn't kind of work the way we wanted it to. Let me go on down now. Okay, now I can walk in the door. Well, so I can't seem to edit the markup. You can't, you, can you add a markup, but you can't edit it, or how does it work? Seems like you ought to be able to add something to it. So if you want, go ahead and try. This is very strange. I'm looking at that ceiling, which seems to be at a very odd location. <laughs> back into the atrium. So in here, I should be able to look up and kind of see, it's not too bad. Okay, I'll save this viewpoint too. But go ahead and just play with these at some point. It really is just, you know, we're kind of all learning about how to work with this. Let me say uh, circular stairs. But enough of just sort of playing, because at some level it's very similar. I want to show you just a little bit about the whole notion of how we go through and start finding interferences and clashes and stuff like that. And do it with a little bit of control, because that's really where this starts getting to be pretty interesting. And to sort of get us going in that direction, just a little bit, to kind of set the stage. The idea is this is tool called the clash detection. And as we do that, we do a couple different things. We create tests different tests for different things we want to clash. So the idea is, if you just clash the entire model, you may have 15,000 things that are clashing and it's not very useful. Whereas we get a lot of little tests for specific pairs of things or things that we know are interesting. We can go back and, you know, Alejandro 
Bloomberg could own one type of clash test, Romney could own a different type of clash, you can go back and keep on rerunning those, and you'll be responsible for a certain category of clashes, a certain category of appearances. So we create some different tests. Within those, what we do is we choose some different things, we select items that we want to include or don't want to include, and we can just choose things in the selection tree. But we can go through and choose things by properties or sets or even custom properties, which is a really useful thing because then if we set up a parameter that says that these objects belong to a certain subcontractor, yeah, we can look for his specific clashes and sort of find those. But we select some things and then we go ahead and kind of look at the results and we can sort of start viewing and assigning different clashes and sort of managing that as part of a whole change management, just ultimately making sure the clashes get resolved. But for today, just to get started, in our last couple minutes together today, let's just go ahead and kind of create something simple. Again, we could do this in Navisworks or we could do it in BIM 360. They both sort of work very similarly. I'm going to do it in Navisworks because I think it has one of the better viewing environments for doing this. And here's how it all sort of works. So I'm hanging around in there. I have my different models. They're looking pretty good. If I want to start thinking about understanding where the clashes are, computationally as opposed to just visually sort of finding out where we think they are. I can go to the Clash Detective. So go ahead and choose that tool. It took me a long time to figure out what that icon is. It looks like a piece of candy to me, but it's actually it's like two boxes yeah. clashing into each other. Okay. As we go through here, you'll see we have the selection tree open. I'm going to close that right now just so we're not looking at everything. We have over here a window where the window has some selection things. Selection A versus selection B. We'll look at that in just a second. There's the notion of adding a test. We don't have any tests defined right now, so we're gonna add those. We're gonna talk about what kind of clash is, whether it's a hard interference, whether it's a tolerance, whether it's some sort of clearance we want. And ultimately we're gonna run that and get some results. So, the idea is, in this dialog, after we add a test, there's some rules, some selection, and some results, and then ultimately some reporting that we want to give it to you as a text file or an HTML file. Okay, but let's start by just adding a test. And you can import or export these. The good thing is, is if you've done some work and you've defined a specific type of clash on one project, you can import them and export them so that you can kind of keep your, your favorite types of clashes to go looking for and use them on several different projects. So I'm going to say add a test, and we'll give this a name. Oh, let's go ahead and again, I'll look for the, let's do the one that we I always like. I'll say structural beams versus uh, ductwork. An ever popular one. Okay, right now that's considered a new clash, so there's nothing in there yet, so there's no issues in different statuses. But what we can do now is go through and fill it out and kind of see how we want to describe it. Under the rules tab, which honestly I don't use nearly as much as you could, you can start filtering out just as a whole things, you know, whether we want to ignore clashes by different things. Ignore clashes that are in the same file, ignore things that have the same snap points, that are in the same group or in the same layer. You have ways to sort of filtering out some things that you just want to ignore, just things that yeah, you know are going to clash but don't, aren't really interesting to you, just so you don't have to worry about them. The second tab is the selection. This is where you sort of get the A versus B. So very much like in Revit, okay, although you can be quite selective about this. An easy thing would be if we want to do that sort of beams versus duct work is go down here under the structural section go to like a specific level, like level two, and choose the structural framing. You can even sort of see whatever is there. There's a whole bunch of uh, beams under there. Under level one, we could also get the structural framing over there. I'm trying to see if I can shift, I can't shift click it. It's one of those ones where I may want to go through and create a set. Let me just do it on a specific level right now. It works as control for you? Ah, very good. Thank you. But again, if, what's up? 
creating a set that's going to be better. Exactly. In the longer run, we'd like to create a set that really starts to filter it down by a specific set of criteria. Oh, only the girders and only the ones that are on these levels and the ones that are controlled by, you know, a small, you know, someone's specific zone of control, the ones that are in a specific designer's realm of controls, so that would be look at it. Okay? And we'll do that as the one. Over here on the other side, we can start looking at, for example, under mechanical. Oh, let's again, we'll go to level one, and I'll say, I'll just go ducts right now. I'm not even going to go for the, uh, like, the duct fittings or the ducts, the flexi ducts and stuff like that. I'm just going to go for the, the big ones. So I'll do that on level one, two, and three also. Now, some choices down here, there's the whole choice about whether you want to do the geometry, any lines or nodes, and surfaces are generally the way to do it. Think about the faces of different things. There's something about self-intersecting things, and we can sort of look for that. And there's also this whole notion right here of if you've just selected a bunch of things, you know, we could go through and like uh, just use a selection tree and grab a bunch of things that are currently selected right now. But as Alejandro suggested, the best way to do this is, okay, right now we're looking at the standard tree. We can also select things over here. There's something called the compact tree, okay, which is just a subset of what's available in the main tree. There's properties, okay, where these are different sort of elements properties, and we can select things based on the specific attributes of the different elements. So if you had a task ID or you had subcontractor, you can just really quickly grab the selection set, which is everyone who matches a certain value. Or if we actually had some sets to find, your sets would be here also. Right now there aren't any, just because there are just nothing defined that way. But we'll do that next time. So we got these, we got those. You have the choice. Is it going to be a hard clash? That is actually it's physically touching. I always have to remember what the difference between hard and hard conservative is. I'll look that up for you between now and then. Clearance clashes are ones that are um, near each other but don't necessarily have to be touching. Duplicates happens every once in a while, especially if uh, you have a bunch of elements that you have in the architectural file. They made duplicates of them in the uh, like a mechanical file or the structural file. Yeah. You can sort of basically find to make sure that like, uh, you know, people don't have two copies of every toilet or something like that. We're not going to link it to timeline or just yet. We are going to say the whole issue of tolerance is sort of what's the minimum amount of tolerance that you actually care about? Okay, so you, know, you can set that right down to zero. You, you can decide whether you want to allow that things could overlap a little. You know, so if it's less than a half of an inch or something like that, I'm going to call it even as opposed to doing that. This link and the step down here, that has to get into this notion of a time-based clash. So it may not be clashing today, but based on sort of a schedule, it may be clashing sometime in the future. Or what more commonly happens is things appear to be clashing, but they won't once you sort of understand that some things move in temporarily and they move out again. So you can start controlling that. But you run all these things by saying, let's run the test. What's happening here? It looks like nothing happened. It would surprise me that nothing actually sort of click. Uh, I'm betting that they belong to a different level. That's this other thing you have to sort of watch out for. Let me try this. I'm just going to do the whole file there. Hard. OK. That's something. I'll think about why they weren't clashing and when I just had that there. It had to do something with the way the selection was, whether those things really belonged to that level. But here we go now with a whole bunch of different clashes. Actually, not too often bad. There's only 12 of them. At least in terms of ducks, it looks like it's too often done. Okay, right now there's 12 new clashes. None of them are considered active, reviewed, or approved. That's kind of new. 
you know, active might mean that kind of we're currently working on it. Reviewed could mean that, hey, it's uh, we reviewed it and it's kind of okay. Something like that. Resolved should be, I'm sort of interested about that with reviewed versus approved. Because uh, there is this notion that some clashes are okay. You sort of looked at them and we're going to live with it. Stuff like that. Maybe active means that it hasn't yet been reviewed. I don't know, I've got to figure out what that status means in terms of how people are actually started using it. But you have a list of different clashes down here, and let's kind of talk about it. Because here's the deal. Down here at the bottom, you have a list of different things that are current clash, currently clashing, and you have the items that are currently involved in that clash. Then over here in this window, it actually shows you the clash. Let me go ahead and put away the properties window and the saved viewpoints. And let's see if we can sort of try choosing a few different clashes and see if we can sort of uh, figure out where they are. Okay, so for clash number two, what it's actually doing is it's highlighting something in red and something in green. It's actually over there on that side. It's showing us that there's some sort of a concrete uh, floor that's interfering with a round duct. It's currently over there a little bit right now. Let me try a third one. That looks like what's happening here. Again, some concrete floors interfering with some duct. Again, even over here, what's happening here? It looks like just all these concrete decks are interfering with the ducts. Must be something interesting about the ducts and kind of where the mechanical stuff, or the, uh, the, the beam, or the columns are actually hiding, or the beams are actually hiding. Interesting. In terms of working with this and sort of playing around with it, there's a couple things that are sort of interesting to do. One is, for example, we have a series of clashes here, and you can think of all these things being completely independent, but the truth is they're usually sort of related to each other. So for example, there is a round duct over here. It's kind of hanging around this item to round duct. It has a specific number. If you want to go through and actually start to group things together so they make a little more sense, what you can do is either group everything that's related to clashing with that floor, or you could group it based on everything that's clashing with that duct. So if I want to go through and sort of bring together everything that's related to that duct, what did I do just right there? Pop you up. What I can do is say group everything involving that item. What it'll do then is actually just kind of create a group. Looks like there wasn't too much in there. This is surprising to me because there's like so few clashes right now. I sort of expected to be a lot more able to keep on playing with it. But the idea is that you can find anything over here. If you want to group things together, you can sort of start grouping all the different things. Like, oh, this is actually an interesting one. So for this one, there's only one under that one. How many is there under this one? Looks like there's actually three different things that are all sort of related to the same uh, piece of ductwork over there. So you can start to think then about really how we have to go through and resolve that. You know, who's going to be responsible and stuff like that. In terms of how these things are displayed, let me kind of pop over here. There's the highlighting, there's the transparent dimming. Let me turn on auto reveal. See if that helps us in terms of our viewing. That's a little bit better because that's actually sort of zooming us in to the part. Without auto reveal, what was happening was it was showing us the whole model but you couldn't necessarily see things so well. Then what we can do is say hide other. Dim other is what's happening right now. Let me turn hide other on. That might make it a little bit easier to see where the clashes are. So it really depends on whether you want to see all those things or not. There's also the notion of whether you want to simulate move on in there. This is going to sort of show you uh, zooming in. 
which again helps just get you oriented to where the clash is. But the idea is we're ultimately going to start collecting a whole bunch of different clashes. And what we want to do with those clashes is to do a couple different things. We can go through and assign them to people, or we can comment on them, or we can even go through and change their status. So for all these different clashes, what you can do is for any of them, we can say, great, OK, this one over here, hmm, for whatever reason, we're going to decide that one's going to go to Rami. And this one over here, okay, that one's going to go to Alejandro. We can go through and embed comments in things. Put that over there. But we can actually start to see like who people, different things are assigned to, and we can start controlling all that stuff. For each of these different clashes, there's this whole notion of whether it's approved or not in the status for each of these things. Let me go ahead and assign, unassign, add column, quick filter by status is new, apply to Alejandro. I could go through and just find all the new ones, or I can go through and find everything that's assigned to Alejandro, or just really however I want to go through and filter this. Once we've gone ahead, and let me clear the quick filter, and get it back out there. If we want to report these things out, here's the final thing you tend to do in here. And we'll play around with all this some more. Is once you have a whole list of different clashes and you have them assigned to different people and you're ready to go through and start kind of answering some of these different things, what you can do is as follows. We can report them out. I can report them all by going to the report tab and producing like a little HTML version of the file that'll have all those different viewpoints. And then later on, after the uh, kind of result, I can go back and rerun the test. And rerunning the test, we'll go through and see. We should see things moving from, you know, you know, the clashes. That number should be decreasing. And then we can go ahead and knock them off and sort of say, to really confirm whether they're still there or not. You compare that from version to version. So reporting looks like, we'll say report. You choose what you want to do. I'll make it an HTML report. I'll just write this out. locations, but you'll see that it's not necessarily, oh, as fluid as you might want it to be. Let me go back to my computer. Let's see if I get to my desktop. trying to do to me here. It's only because of the way I'm set up in this uh, kind of funky environment. Uh, da, 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 da. Go out to my desktop. And I'll say beams versus ductwork. It opens it up. And what you get is a report that looks like this. It has all the different ones. It has in here what the clash point is, which is great if you actually know how to sort of resolve coordinates like that. It actually has these numbers. Now these numbers are actually sort of useful in that you can go ahead and find things. So for example, if I go to the structural file and I look for 186254, it'll find that thing for me. If I go to a 10962, it'll find that thing for me. That's kind of okay, but it's still as fun as this is, and as good as this is, and a lot of people do sort of navigate it this way, okay, it's still a little bit hard to follow. And that's really the point of doing this in GIMP360 uh, as opposed to doing it in Navisworks, because this is fine. What will happen here is we can do something called switching back, where if you have Navisworks open, you can 
choose a clash and switch back to the Net or Revit application and make the change and bring it back very quickly and see if you resolve it. Okay. That kind of works okay. We'll play with that next time. But the other way to do it is to do what they do within BIM 360, which is to say, great, we found that clash. Let's go ahead and just send you that clash. And when I send you that clash, it has the viewpoint and everything loaded in it. So you don't have to do the searching because when you open that clash, it takes you right to it. Okay, so in the good old BIM 360 world, we're over here. If we want to do clashes, we say that we want to go through, and I'll just go ahead and real quickly, I'll do exactly what I usually tell you not to do. I'm just going to do the architectural model versus the structural model. Okay. It'll do the analysis. Notice the order was a little bit different about how I said it. I have all these different clashes. I have 1,900 or 67 of them open. I can go ahead and group these oh, by the architectural model art. So if I go through and choose something like that, what's it showing me here? It's basically a whole bunch of ones in there that basically have a wall and it's intersecting with a whole lot of structural columns. But again, that will probably decide is okay because we just didn't go through and uh, take those out. We have the compound ceiling. There's like 12 things clashing with it right now. So what's happening there? Again, a bunch of structural columns are uh, kind of interfering with it. we we'll go to a specific one. going ahead and try to resolve it. So somewhere that green thing and the blue thing are intersecting with each other. But the idea is now if I have this, again, I can comment on it. I can go ahead and write about it, or I can send it to someone and just mail it off and stuff like that. And that's kind of oh, the reason for doing that. It's the interesting thing about working with it, though, is you start contrasting it. The really good thing about Navisworks is Navisworks lets you set up those selection sets. So it's much better than just trying to select things over here. In BIM 360, there's no such thing as a selection set. It really is just kind of working with the tree. But in BIM 360, the clashing, same exact clashing algorithm, so it'll find the same things. But when you go ahead and find the clash and you nail it off, you get the viewpoint directly, you can make the change. And then as soon as they re-blue it, you can rerun the clash test. So you know what I'm saying? It's the tale of two cities thing. In many ways, it's doing exactly the same thing. But around the edges, it gets to be a little bit different. Okay, cool. Let us adjourn them for today. We'll keep on playing with this some more uh, in terms of clash detection. And next time, what we'll do on the iPad is we're actually going to like, uh, show you the BIM 360 field, which is that application for uh, basically going through and walking around a site, basically noting different issues and things that need to be resolved, taking pictures of those issues, and storing those in a database. So this is kind of in the planning side, you find the issues and introduce them for resolution, as opposed to what people do in the field when they're actually finding the issues where things don't necessarily get put in the same way they uh, got planned. Right. Okay, let us break for today.